If, as British Prime Minister Harold Wilson claimed, a week is a long time in politics, then Prabowo Subianto is really pushing the upper limits of that supposition. Two years, they say, is an eternity. <laughs> Tipped by many as a possible future president of Indonesia, the soldier-turned-politician seems to have begun his campaign in earnest. Tough military man or consensus-building politician? Judge for yourself. The interview with Prabowo Subianto. Throughout his life, Prabowo Subianto has worn many uniforms. But in his first public address outside Indonesia here in Singapore, he admitted that his nervousness had resulted in a three-day debate about what to wear for the occasion. The correct uniform to clearly identify his purpose. I hope I look presidential. <laughs> And that is the goal, his self-declared last battle, the 2014 presidential election. But what about the man himself? What role primarily defines him? Soldier, businessman or politician? Prabowo Subianto, thank you very much for speaking with Channel News Asia. Now thank you've you. been a soldier, a businessman, a politician. If I were to ask you to choose one role that best represents Prabowo Subianto, the man, in one sentence, what would that be? I think a uh, uh, loyal son of Indonesia. And which role would that fit into? Soldier, businessman, politician? I think the three roles tend to uh, develop from each other, you know. Um, as a soldier, you serve your country. As an entrepreneur, you also serve your country. You know, you create jobs. And as a politician, you also serve your your people in your country. So I think it sort of flows from each. You know, as a patriot, you want to serve. You want to be a, a loyal uh, son of your people. Well, you've stated that one of your mantras is who dares wins. And actually, that's a motto of the British Special Air Services. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. So well, there are certain variations, yes. <laughs> would it be fair to say then that the militaristic mindset is ingrained in you? I would not say militaristic, but let us say um, the heritage of a soldier, of an officer, the heritage of a warrior knight. And this guides you in how you conduct yourself in business and politics as well? Yes, I think it guides me. I, you know, I have to uh, conduct myself with honor. I must not uh, break my word. I must face hardship and challenges with courage. Well, I've actually read that you wanted to take a break from politics, but you were so furious with the conditions of the country that you decided to run in 2014. Is that true? I would not put it that harshly, furious, but let's say uh, worried, uh, disappointed, uh, so concerned what, about what the future. What kind of conditions cause such emotions from you? Yes, the fact that... Uh, Corruption has been so um, prevalent, increasing. It's like a like a disease. It's like cancer. That I think it's uh, very, very worrying for the future of Indonesia. And you know, as uh, I said in my lectures, in my speeches, um, our our challenges are so great. We have a population explosion in Indonesia. We have uh, 3.8 million new mouths every year. We have to feed. We have to clothe. Uh, we have uh, energy resources depleting very soon. These are, these are tremendous challenges and um, we need uh, strong leadership. We need, uh, we need a change in Indonesia. Well, it's an open secret that 
some people fear you and you perhaps still have this image of a hard military man. Is that image justified? I don't think so, but uh, a hard military man, I mean, uh, if I were in active service, yeah, I have to be a good military man. But of course, you know, you are what you are and uh, you serve and you uh, present yourself. So I think let the Indonesian people decide. Are you doing anything to perhaps change that image of you? I'm not doing anything special. I, I just try to be myself. You know, I, I, when I speak, I speak from my heart, from my conviction. I don't usually use notes. I, yeah, I try to be myself. You know, I think that's the, that's the best policy. You know. Well, actually, that no-nonsense image of yours is a double-edged sword because on the one hand, um, people are saying they back you because they feel that Indonesia needs a strong, firm leader. But on the other hand, it has probably also made you enemies. And you've said that um, you s sought wisdom in this ancient saying that a thousand friends is too few and one enemy is too many. Right. Do you think that you've made too many enemies? Can you really take charge of the country as president and rally the entire rakyat, the entire people behind you? Uh, I think I did make enemies in my career. You know, I, I was a no-nonsense guy, mission-oriented. You know, I, I was a combat officer, you know. Once you've been in combat, you don't really think too much about ceremonies and uh, niceties. And uh, so I, I think on that case, I was a bit too abrasive. But uh, I think uh, now, you know, I am, I am older, I think a bit wiser, I hope. <laughs> um, but in the end, I think it's what you stand for. It's, it's the principles you stand for that, that matters, I think. And I think this is coming across that, um, that in the end, I, I'm a good servant of my people. And if they need me, I will serve. Well, Susilo Bangbang Yodo, you know, Wiranto, yourself, all ex-military, it seems that the Indonesian military still looms large in politics. Why do you think this is the case? Why are there so many former army figures in politics right now? When my generation entered the military, that was in the 70s, the military of Indonesia had very high prestige. The Indonesian National Army, the TNI, was a liberation army. It was an army of liberation. And it was a people's army. And I think the Indonesian society respected that. The majority of Indonesian people in the end, in a critical situation, we look to the army as a, as a unifying force. And you think this is still the case 14 years since they've experienced democracy? Well, all the surveys and the research say that, that the majority of the Indonesian people, they, they still believe in the loyalty, the credibility of the TNI, the Indonesian National Army. And I think this, this is the, the background why they, they feel comfortable with a, with a former military leader. Any good tailor will tell you that the clothes maketh the man. But an electorate considers much more than the uniform a candidate wears. The campaign period is crucial. Does Prabowo have the political stamina to keep going till 2014? And does he possess a manifesto that can realistically tackle the economic challenges facing Indonesia? Find out after the break. Hailing from what he calls a family of fighting Indonesian patriots, Prabowo Subianto is about to fight for the presidency of his beloved Indonesia. He started early, but can he maintain the momentum right up to the 2014 polls? I'm a realistic 
person in politics. One day you can go up and the next day you can go down. So it's a long way to go, you know. So, That's right. Uh, two years is a long time in two, politics. Two years, they say, is an eternity. <laughs> so what are you trying to do to maintain your current momentum? Uh, I, I go with the flow. I, I work uh, from day to day, from week to week. I go with my uh, message. I keep on message. Which is? Uh, which is uh, clean government. That is my main message. We must prepare for the future. We must uh, get our act together. Must that is up. my message. In Indonesian, it sounds I berdiri di atas kaki sendiri. Hoping that That's what will go away former President Soekarno in always in proposed. We must have the strength, the courage to stand on our own two feet, and we must pull ourselves with our own effort. But there are reported splits in your party, and the founding chair, um, and a founding member and deputy chair, Halida Hatta, has quit. And some people are saying that was in protest to your strong leadership style. Is that true? No, no, I don't, I, I don't think so. It's completely not. I mean, she, she resigned. She told me that she, she had to concentrate on her work and in her new job in the company. They preferred her not to be involved in politics. Golkar's Abu Rizal Bakri has expressed his interest in running for president. Do you see him as your main threat? I think, um, I, don't, I don't see them as threats. I see it, you know, competi competitors. I mean, that's democracy. You have, to, you have to compete. We compete with our ideals, our solutions that we offer to the country. So, you know, uh, let's let's go with, you know let's go ahead uh, in a real democracy for a real democracy to be successful it needs to be complemented by a vibrant economy prabowo's family has a strong background in finance his grandfather was the founder of bank negara indonesia and his father a noted economist was president suharto's finance minister so whilst economic planning may be in his dna is it in his presidential campaign manifesto when you ran in 2009 mm -hmm. as vice presidential candidate, you revealed your economic strategy, which has been dubbed Probonomics. <laughs> and, uh, really? <laughs> oh, oh, that's new to you? <laughs> well, yeah, there are a lot of reports that have called it Probonomics. Really? And the focus, yeah. I believe, is to intensify development in mainly agriculture yes, and yes. have state-owned enterprises as the key drivers of growth. Yes. Has this evolved since 2009? I'm still uh, convinced that that is the way to go. Yeah, we, we, our competitive advantage is actually in the agriculture sector. Our, our weakness also is in agriculture sector, but our opportunity is also in the agriculture sector. Why you see, is it a weakness? You see, a, a weakness in the sense that the present situation now, we import too much of our food from abroad. All my predictions are coming through. I warned that Indonesia cannot afford to be reliant on foreign imports of food because uh, the potential for, for uh, natural disasters in the other countries are too much. But so, can and Indonesia really be self-sufficient? No, it's not can. We must. We must. What? are your plans to move towards that? Do we have um, 77 million hectares of destroyed forest? Destroyed. And increasing every day, every year. As we speak 10 minutes, there are forests the size of six soccer fields being destroyed. So this is very dangerous. And uh, we must stop this. Of and one of my proposals is to sector. convert Can you imagine a part of this destroyed forest into productive land. And this uh, should be concentrated on creating, uh, producing food and bioenergy. This will make us uh, self-sufficient in food and self-sufficient in energy. So this is my grand strategy, what I call the big push strategy. But critics say agriculture is not the path towards a developed economy. What's your comeback to that? No, no, I don't agree. It is, 
It depends on the, on the economy. It depends on the society. You know, you, you have Finland that, is, that has a lot of uh, timber, many, many years, and then they developed into a high tech, you know. So uh, you have United States, very strong agriculture, but they also are into industries, high tech, science. So I, don't, I, think, uh, I think it's the other way around. I think agriculture is the base for all economic development. Human civilization is food. Food is the essence of life. Food is the essence of life, and Prabowo is trying to reinstate it as the essence of what he calls his economic big push. But what about Indonesia's relations with its neighbors, and indeed the rest of the world? Find out in a moment on The Interview. Prabowo Subianto describes himself as a loyal son of Indonesia, but his childhood was very international. While his father was on the run for supporting a failed regional revolt, Prabowo grew up in Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Switzerland and the UK. So what are his foreign policy views? Since assuming the ASEAN chair, Indonesia seems to have pursued more of a leadership role within the group. Is an assertive Indonesia taking charge regionally in line with Prabowo's vision for his country? You cannot be, say that I am your leader. You must, you must create respect. You must create uh, understanding. Respect and understanding we cannot, we cannot impose on others. And that's why Indonesia must get its act together. We can say we're the fourth biggest country in the world. We are part of the G20. We are the 16th biggest economy in the world. We can say that, but if everybody knows that 50% of our population are under the poverty line, who will respect us? So your focus is to build Indonesia from within first? I think that's, that's the only alternative, you know. You must be solid. If you are solid, if the country is wealthy, there's uh, prosperity, our people are enjoying uh, a good quality of life, people everywhere will listen to us. But a real concern in the region is actually China's rising military might, um, especially in the South China Sea. How do you view China? We have to respect their rise and uh, we maintain good relations with them. Any rising power will, of course, they will have a, a very strong military. That's their right. Now, how we in ASEAN, uh, how we approach our relationship, it must be based on, as I said earlier, good communications, good relations, good friendship, and uh, the desire to accommodate each other. Well, in, partly in response to China, the U.S. has refocused its attention and resources to Asia. And this includes the military. So it's increased its military presence in Southeast Asia. How do you view that? I am not really concerned because they are a global power. They can move their military anywhere. But, you know, in this globalized world, in this high-tech world, do you know that now they can send uh, an unarmed plane from Florida coming to Singapore, uh, controlled from Florida. They don't need to be here. You understand? Uh, scientifically and technically, military weaponry and development is so advanced that actually it doesn't matter where they base their, their forces. This is the development of, of military science up to now. So we have to be realistic. They are a global power. They will be where they want to be. And, uh, and uh, perhaps it will be a good uh, factor for stabilization, you know. Well, you've been quite open about your admiration for Singapore's founding father, Lee Kuan Yew. And you've even modeled your party, Gurindra, after his, uh, the party he founded, the People's Action Party. Just what is it? 
that you admire about Lee Kuan Yew? Uh, I grew up in Singapore as a, as a small boy. So I, I followed Singapore's development. I also grew up in Malaysia, so I'm very familiar with you know, Singapore and Malaysia. What I was impressed, my family, we were all impressed by uh, the commitment by the early Singapore leaders, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and his, and his cohort. They wanted to provide a clean government for the people of Singapore. And, and I, that was, I think, uh, what we wanted to do too in Indonesia. Well, you've said this presidential race will be your last battle for your country. Now this, it's this is my age. How can, you know, if, 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 if you're need, not needed, you must know when to step aside. <laughs> but if you are successful, what would you like your first line of legacy to be? I want to lay the foundation, the groundwork for the transformation of the Indonesian economy so that we can be a stable, modern, advanced, industrial and just society. That is my ambition. That is my driving motivation. Thank you very much, Prabowo Subianto, for Thank sharing you. your insights on the interview. Thank you for having me. Thank you.